Mark Edmondson, welcome back to the show. Thanks so much. Delighted to be here. So we had you on the show uh, back in January uh, to talk about your book, Self and Soul, and um, got a lot of great feedback on that episode. People loved it. And today I want to bring you back to talk about your the first book that I read of yours that really turned me on to your writing. It's called Why Football Matters. Um, as someone who played football in middle school and high school, I just resonated with what what you wrote resonated with me a lot. And I'm sure a lot of people who played football in high school or middle school will probably resonate with what we talk about today. Um, so let's talk about this. Uh, it's about your lessons you've learned from football when you played back in high school. Yeah. But let's talk about your, your experience with football. What was your first contact with the game? My first contact with the game was watching the New York football giants on a Sunday afternoon with my dad. And uh, my dad was a rabid fan. Uh, and um, there was a preliminary before the game. He would get himself all set up with his cigarettes and his chair and his hassock. And then there was his chocolate bar that had to be in the right place. And then the music would come on and he would be absolutely glued and wrapped, especially if the Giants were playing against the Cleveland Browns. And he could see Jim Brown. So, And uh, my father was a very agitated person. He was always on the go. He worked two jobs, two jobs as a short order cook, 16 hours a day sometimes. And uh, he had a tremendous amount of energy. And I think the only time I ever really saw him stabilize was uh, in front of the TV watching football. And so that was a, a time for me to get next to him and listen to him talk and maybe ask him a question or two and uh, get a little closer to him than I'd been. Yeah. And I'm sure, did your dad probably you know, impart some lessons about manliness or being a man while you're watching football, while, while watching Jim Brown or watching the Giants? Yes, yes. Um, you know, Jim Brown was somebody who had been given spectacular gifts by the gods, and he had nourished those gifts and uh, uh, developed them, and he had become just the greatest football player and maybe the greatest athlete who ever lived. I think the case can still be uh, be made. So that was the example of somebody who had extraordinary gifts. My father was a little more interested in Y.A. Tittle, who I understand just celebrated his maybe his 91st birthday, the one of the two oldest people alive in the um, Football Hall of Fame. Uh, my father loved Y.A. Tittle, partly because Tittle looked like somebody who really didn't have much natural ability, and, and he probably didn't. Um, and yet he had taken what he had and developed every single thing that he had to make himself not just a good, but really an extremely good football player. He was nothing like Jim Brown, uh, uh, but uh, he was very good indeed. And I think that was my father's main kind of drift, the the undercurrent of his talk there. He was very interested in people who had not perfect skills or perfect capacities, but nonetheless took what they had and used every single ounce of it to achieve something that was worth achieving. Okay. I think we can take that. We can, we'll talk about this later. I think that's a good uh, segue or connection to your Hector and Achilles uh, dichotomy you set up later on when you talk about courage in football. Um, but before we get there, so you, you watched the game with your dad and it was a way for you sure. to connect with your father. But you were this fat, asthmatic kid, wore glasses, you know, the stereotypical non-jock. Yet in high school, I think you were a junior, you decided to go out for the football team. Uh, what drove you to do that? Were you just wanting to have some fun, hang out with friends, or did you have some larger existential reasons why you wanted to play? If I did have those reasons, and I think I did, they probably weren't available to me consciously. You know, I knew that my life was kind of flying off in every direction. My, our home life was tough. My sister had been very sick, and she had died at the age of seven. It was really dubious whether my family was going to stay together or not. Um, it was really because of my mother's amazing uh, resilience that we, uh, that we did. Um, and uh, I was looking for some form of stability. I couldn't find it in school because I had some academic talent, but I hated the classes. Um, so I couldn't find it there. And I decided I would give football a, a shot. I'd always liked it down the park, and I was surprisingly not too bad for a fat kid with glasses and, uh, and asthma. And uh, so I spent the summer before that uh, junior year trying to get in shape a little bit, and uh, I got a little stronger and a little faster, and I uh, ended, up going up, uh, ended up going out for the team and uh, making it, not by much, but make it I did. And uh, in a lot of ways, it changed my life and for the most part made it better. And what position did you play? Um, I played um, guard, the glamour position, 
and linebacker, or as I was called, because I played without my glasses, blindbacker. Blindbacker. All right. Okay. I was a center uh, Ooh, in my, my playing that's, days. That's the tough guy. That's the, t- the tough guy. Yeah. No, yeah. I, the, I, here's the thing. I couldn't long snap. I couldn't do shotgun snap. <laughs> so right. we always had to go right from under, right from underneath. Um, uh-huh. You also have to know what the count is when it when it actually gets hiked, which not everybody can remember. Right. I could do that. I could do that, but I couldn't yeah, shot. Yeah, there you go. That. All right. Um, so yeah, your your book is about these lessons that you learn from playing football and how you just said, you know, it really did improve your life. But at the same time, there you're sort of the way you write about the book, you're you're kind of ambivalent about the lessons you um, you got from football. Uh, why is that? Why why were you sort of hesitant to be you know gush completely about how amazing football was? What is it about the sport or th- your experience with it that made you sort of well yeah it's good but there's also you had some reservations about it. Yeah, I did. I mean, uh, overall, especially high school football, I am a great defender of and appreciator uh, of, um, and I think that some of the coaches and some of the players who are involved with that game are just terrific teachers and terrific comrades, and you. You can't beat it. Um, but, um, you know, just talking about a virtue like character. and Character is a great virtue. And there are a lot of ways to define character. But just in a shorthand way, I said, you know, character is the ability to get up every day and do pretty much a sequence of very positive things that are helping you very gradually to grow. Uh, and football was very good at teaching you that. You know, you, you learned how to block. You learned how to tackle. Every day you learned a little more technique. Every day you got a little stronger and more determined and you learned more. And eventually you became a really quite a, quite a better player. But the downside of that, and, and you can transfer that over into all kinds of activities, right? You know, if you're a businessman or building a business, if you're a writer building a book, if you're uh, somebody with a website building up its resonance in the world, you know, one little step at a time is often the way that it works. That's fantastic. But... Um, there's also a kind of lockstep automaton-like quality to football character. You know, the, you're always doing what the coach says. You're always filling out. You're always doing your job, as Bill Belichick says. It's not a lot of improvisation, especially if you're the guard. And uh, <laughs> and so there was this kind of a sense of, you know, character is great, but too much character annuls, and I like this little pairing here, annuls personality sometimes and, and flair and individuality. Fortunately, we had some real individualists on our team who couldn't be... Um, uh, much daunted by the robotic quality of football, but they were mostly defensive backs, and they were much more um, glamorous guys than we linemen uh, were. But you know, character has its downside. Courage has its downside. And all kinds of all kinds of things came up as I was thinking about the game. Right, and it's so going back to this idea of character, um, sort of stick to itiveness, and um, how has it played out in your life? I mean, you're a college professor now. You write books. How is the character that you developed while playing? high school football helped you and how has it hurt you? I mean, have you ever caught yourself thinking, boy, I'm sort of becoming an automaton here. It's been good. I, I've, you know, I had some really good educational chances after I left, um, uh, after I left high school, I went to a very uh, creatively oriented college, Bennington college. And I went to a graduate school in English that was full of very imaginative uh, people, you know, Harold Bloom and Jeffrey Hartman. I went to Yale and so that got a, I got a chance to stimulate the creative side of me, such such as it is. It's not it's what, what other people may may have. Um, but I also spent a lot of time uh, since I was an assistant professor here at Virginia writing books. And there's something of book writing that is, you know, it, it depends on character and it builds character. You just get out there and do the same darn thing every day with a little bit of a difference. And you draft it again and again and again, and you read your criticisms of it, uh, read criticisms of it that come to you, and you assimilate them, and you move forward slowly. So there's a combination of inspiration. You've got to have a good idea that keeps you jazzed, but you also have to have the everyday, workaday virtues that football helped instill. And I think they, they, it came from there. Um, also, there's the fact that, um, that um, I wasn't very good at football. The coaches didn't care that much whether I got better or not. I just did. Um, so I learned how to work without an audience or appreciation or without, you know, getting into the game very much on Saturday and starring. I just learned how to work ahead um, with nobody particularly looking on or cheering, which is really good for a writer. <laughs> well, let's talk about this. I mean, so, yeah, you learned about character, but let's get back to a little, go a little meta here. I mean, what is it about football, the game of football, that makes it so adept at providing life lessons, right? Like it's what it's like the go to sports analogy for yeah. just life. And it's hard to do that with baseball. It's hard to do that. You know, you can do with basketball sometimes. Uh, maybe yeah. sprinting is a good one, like, you know, Olympic sprint, but like football, 
just seems like it's perfect for yeah. life lessons. What is it about the sport, you think? Well, as you probably know, as, as a fellow offensive lineman, um, at least in the high school level and the small college level, it's not all about talent, right? It's about effort. And it, I think it's a sport where you can make yourself a whole lot better um, uh, by effort than almost any other sport I could think of. It's real hard to, to hit a major league curveball if you don't have the eyes and the hands for it, right? It's real hard to, in, to drop your time by a second in the 100-meter dash, no matter what, right? But you can get to be a pretty darn good lineman um, just through desire and through commitment. And um, you, uh, you, so that's a, a template that's available to lots and lots of guys, whereas some other sports, they exclude you just because of your relative lack of talent. If you don't have the talent to be the wide receiver or the quarterback, there's still probably room for you somewhere in the interior line, even if it's on the third string. And so you get this chance to, to, uh, to educate yourself. And it's also a sport where effort really does pay off. I mean, I played tennis before. I could play tennis day after day, year after year, and I would get no better um, because my, the fundamental talent isn't there. But football, I could get better, even if the coaches didn't see it. Right. I think another aspect of football is there's a lot of luck involved. Like there's things that just like a fumble happens, you get a bad yes. call, and like that's like life. Things just happen that you have no control over and you have to, you have to deal with it. You're right. There's that beautiful tension in football between the absolutely outrageously unexpected thing that just sort of happens, the tip or the interception or the fumble, and then the fact that in order to succeed, you also have to grind it out. Right? So the grinding out is part of the game, but the exuberant moment is part of the game, too. It makes it really exciting to watch. And it also, as you say, as you suggest, it teaches you that you're like bad stuff happens, right? And you just got to kind of walk away from it and see if you can't recoup the next play. Right. Uh, so you talked about uh, how you learn about character, developing character, but you also talk about how football can teach courage. Um, so what kind of courage are we talking about here? Because this is a, you know, there's all sorts of courage. There's moral courage. Yeah. Martial courage, uh, intellectual well, courage. I guess I'm, right. I'm thinking about physical courage, and uh, I'm thinking about the ability, uh, which I didn't have when I started, uh, to stick my head and shoulder in and make a tackle. Um, it's just a very it's counterintuitive, as they say. You don't really want to do that if you're somebody who is as kind of self-protective and somewhat timid as, uh, as I was. And I figured out how to do that. I figured out how to do that, but it wasn't easy. The way I figured out how to do it was that I would work myself up into a rage by thinking about different things that had made me really angry or humiliated me a lot. Uh, and then I was kind of a beast out there, and I was really throwing myself here and there. Um, and that's, you know, that's one form of courage. I don't know if that's what um, Lawrence Taylor was doing when he was uh, you know, running around the line for the Giants. I don't know if that's what Jim Brown was doing. I think maybe, maybe it was in some measure. But that's what I was doing, and it's great. All right, but the problem with that is that you have, as it were, let the beast out of the cage, and the beast may come out of the cage some other time when you don't really need it to, and when you're not in the confines of the football field. Or on a football field, you may do something that you eventually come to regret. So, as I said in the book, you know, even though I feel that I have a pretty good, um, uh, uh, pretty good rap on my. Um, uh, the aggressive side that football stimulated in me. I'm still, for you know, a, a, a middle-aged or you know, now early old-age bourgeois guy, um, maybe more likely than the others to get really too mad at somebody and lose it. Um, I don't think I'm going to pop anybody in the nose anymore, but that's partly because my shoulder hurts from playing basketball. <laughs> so there is there is that ambivalence about football. There's a, a a good yeah. thing, but then there's that also that dark side you have to kind of keep your yeah. eye on. But I think, you know, almost all constructive activities have that, right? I mean, I did a PhD. It was great. I loved it. I learned a lot. Delightful. Um, but um, there are occupational hazards to that, you know? You, uh, you, you might tend to dominate the dinner table with your own boring disquisitions on and on and on. Or you might think you know it all, and know it all isn't what you really are. So I think every virtue you acquire has an underside. It's just a matter of kind of looking into them and seeing what they might be. I think the football virtues are pretty dramatic, and the football risks are pretty dramatic too, especially as you move forward in the game into big-time college or big-time pro. Yeah. Well, in your chapter about courage, you, you talk about two models of courage, um, Homer or Hector, not Homer, Hector and Achilles. Yeah. Um, Hector and Achilles, right. Yeah, what's the difference between the two? Well, Achilles is the greatest of the Greek warriors, and he is a natural warrior, right? Um, he is unbeatable uh, on the field, and uh, the story about Achilles is that if he, um, 
Uh, if you stand to fight him, he'll cut you down. If you run from him, he will catch you. There's just there's simply nothing that you can do. When he has his dispute at the beginning with Lord Agamemnon, who's the marshal of the armies about the slave girl, um, there's this sense that in a moment, in a moment, Achilles could destroy Agamemnon, formidable as he is, and the gods intervene. They don't want that to, uh, to happen. So he's a natural warrior, and everything comes easily uh, to him. Hector, on the other hand, says at one point, I had to learn in order to be a soldier. I had to learn to be a fighter. He's much more of a politician, I think, and a, and a kind and judicious one at that. He's the only one, aside from Priam and Troy, who's kindly to Helen, who's in terrible stress, distress when she's there. And so uh, Hector is the gentleman fighter, and he's the one who knows how to turn it on and turn it off. Uh, when Achilles is enraged at Hector for Hector's uh, murder of Patroclus, uh, Achilles simply goes mad. Right? Achilles simply goes mad. Um, you know, you can go mad out there on the football field, but you're taking risks, not only on the football field, but then later on in life. Um, maybe it's not an accident that Jim Brown uh, got into plenty of trouble uh, and also got, got plenty, of, uh, plenty of positive notice after he left football, chiefly for spousal abuse. Right? Um, Lawrence Taylor, perennially in trouble, one of the greatest linebackers, one of my favorite football players, but perennially in trouble for one thing and another. A Hector-like player, I don't know, Steve Young, maybe? I don't think Steve Young's going to get into a whole lot of trouble tomorrow. Um, he's a competitive guy and a tough guy, but he knew how to turn it on and turn it off, and he's got quite a sense of humor about himself and about what he achieved. Jim Brown has many magnificent qualities, but sense of humor I don't think is salient among uh, them. Uh, but, of course, the moral of the story in part is that when Hector and Achilles fight in, uh, in Homer, uh, uh, Hector loses. And, in fact, he's humiliated by Achilles who chases him around the walls of Troy and then butchers him and drags him around behind his, uh, his chariot. So maybe the, uh, the, the wild man has the advantage over the more civilized warrior. And that makes things pretty problematic, it seems to me. Right. And you, you talk about Hector and Achilles in Self and Soul as well. Yes. Uh, yeah. Kind of on the same ideas. I, I, Some... I got a little ex extra mileage out of that. Right. No, it was, it's a great analogy. I, I love it. And particularly, I think it's a good analogy for manliness, too. Um, mm -hmm. some, some people are just born with those, like, they're born yeah. virile. Other guys have to learn it, learn how to do it. Yeah. yeah. And I think the learners are probably more admirable people and the, the sorts of people you want around, except that, I don't know, when it's time to go uh, take care of Osama bin Laden, I don't know if you want Hector going. I think you might want Achilles and a few more guys like him. Yeah, you want uh, the Achilles. Would yeah. require. Natural talent yeah. has the rage that he can't turn off. Um, so, okay, there's courage. Football teaches us about loss. You have a that in there. So this was uh, very pertinent to you because at the time you, as you said earlier, you lost a sister. Um, she was only seven yeah. to a sickness. How did football and like losing in football, how did that help you deal with the loss of your sister? Um, it, it gave me a sense of, um, uh, you know, like football is a theater. And one of the lines in the book that I actually kind of like is that one of the reasons football matters a lot is because it doesn't matter much at all. But it's just a game. And yet you get to work out really strong kinds of emotional dramas on a football field. And uh, I remember vividly the first time uh, we lost when I was a, a junior. Uh, we had a 12-game winning streak, and we lost to Somerville. They, they beat us up horribly. And uh, the whole bus is full of people crying and weeping and bemoaning themselves. And they were just it's a disaster area. And um, I was one of them. And uh, then we sort of continued on in that vein. And the coach at a certain point said, enough, stop it. Here's what you did wrong last week. Now get to work on these things. Now learn how to develop. So what he basically showed us was that, you know, mourning for a game and then also mourning in life, so it's different in many ways, um, requires a certain amount of uh, giving in to the thing. I mean, we really were sad. It was a little bit theatrical. Um, and then also holding up and uh, going back to work and doing what you, uh, doing what you can. My sister had been deceased for quite a while then, but I did see how um, it did help me appreciate my mother, who had um, mourned very fiercely for Barbara Ann. But then after that was done, after that was done, she pulled herself back up because she would have been, and a part of her was ready to mourn forever, just as we were on a smaller uh, scale after we lost to some of them. She pulled herself back up again. She put herself together and she began 
serving dinners and lunches and breakfasts and washing the clothes and doing the things that a 50s and 60s mom was uh, was needing to do and that we, my brother and I and uh, my father, desperately needed for her to do during those uh, uh, during those days. So she kind of she brought her mourning to a certain point. She was wild with grief, and then she stopped it. Um, and uh, that was a more profound lesson than the one I found in the football field. But you know, kids don't always learn from their parents immediately. Sometimes it takes you know five, ten, twenty years. Well, that's a good question. I mean, are these lessons you've gotten from football? I mean, were you aware of them when you were a kid, or or is this you looking back as an older man? There's a, uh, there's a great uh, uh, word that Freud has, noctroglycite. Noctroglycite means reasoning with a later reason. Uh, and I ask my students all the time to look back into their lives and what they've done and to create a uh, reprise of that experience with words uh, so that they can see who they are and how they got there. Um, so a lot of it was um, looking back with um, uh, on. Uh, you know, with, with an adult's kind of insight, if insight it was, and uh, seeing what it was that I'd actually learned there. But for instance, I may have learned a certain amount of character in football. I may have applied that to the writing of my dissertation and the writing of, uh, of books and maybe some other things too. Um, and I wasn't able to articulate it at the time. I wouldn't have been able to articulate it at the time, but I was glad to uh, afterwards. And I don't think the process is ever quite done until you've tried to say what it is you have learned and try to evaluate it, and, and also try to evaluate its downside, as we were just talking about, Brent. Um, so you, you mentioned earlier, before you went out for the team, you uh, tried to get in shape, you started working out, and then uh, between your junior and senior year, you got really into physical training. You said you, you became the supplements guy, like you got all the supplements to gain weight, to get you know, the whey protein. I did. Um, I did. Yeah, and I think I, I did that too uh, when I was in high school. Did really, you? I got really into it, because I wanted to be the best I could be. Um, yeah. But... I'm curious, what did that, your football training, going back to your book, you know, like the self and soul, what did football training teach you about training the mind and the soul? The sort of physical, visceral training teach you about this more abstract, ethereal, ethereal aspect of our lives? Well, it, it, it taught me that the development of the mind, for instance, is a whole lot like the development of the body, though people don't say so. Um, and when I talk to athletes about um, becoming better students, I say, you do, you, you, you're much further along than you think you are. Everything you did as a swimmer or a hockey player or a football player, if you practiced a lot and if you played hard, you already have the template in place for learning. It's just that people have probably told you that you're not as good at learning as you are at sports. But it doesn't matter in a certain way. You are who you are, and you need to make gains in the intellectual field, just as somebody like me who doesn't have much by way of athletic aptitude needed to make gains in the physical uh, field. So those two things, I think, are very close together, and they're probably a little bit underappreciated, the symbiosis between them. If you've done one, you can probably go off and do the other. Right. I mean, there's no, there's a reason why, you know, Aristotle, I feel like the Greeks and the Romans understood this, you know, they make references like, you know, Aristotle, you know, this, you're training the soul just like a wrestler is training the yeah, body. Absolutely. You know? That's a good point. That's a good point. The Greeks had this concept, I probably will pronounce it wrong, kalokogathia, the good mind and the good body feeding each other and strengthening each other. Yeah. Um, so you have a chapter about, you discuss the connection between faith and football. Um, and it is, because I remember when I played high school, I'm in Oklahoma, and football is yeah. religion, Christianity is big here. You know, before every game, we said the Lord's Prayer. Even the Muslim guy on our team, like, joined in and said the Lord's Prayer with us. Um, yeah. What do you make of that connection between faith and football? I mean, what does it say about individuals who worship a Jesus who's meek and mild, yet will go out and harness their Achilles-like rage to physically pummel their opponent on the football field? Well, as you're pointing out, as the book moves forward, it becomes a little bit more a reflection on America through football, and that's kind of the turning point when I start thinking about American religion in relationship to, uh, uh, to the game. And, you know, it's simply a puzzle to me. It simply is a puzzle um, that uh, we have um, uh, football so much associated with the religion. Football's association with the military makes 100% sense from my point of view. They, they do feed off each other in certain ways. But football's association of religion incredibly strange. I mean, if somebody said, as Camille Paglia, my teacher at Bennington for about an hour, um, said, football is my religion. And I know exactly what she means by that. She means that she's a pagan. She likes competition. She's not averse to physical struggle. Um, she looks at things in terms of opposition. She's kind of gladiatorial. That all makes sense. Um, but when somebody says, um, 
you know, I play football and um, Jesus is my religion. I say, whoa, that's a little strange. Jesus playing football is like the least violent person imaginable. Um, so it's just, it's just very puzzling. But it points to the fact that Judeo-Christianity, from some perspectives, is based on a little bit of tension, to say the least. And that's the tension between the relatively mild and relatively sweet-natured, with some exceptions, Jesus, and the uh, figure that's claimed as his father, who is capable of just getting rid of Sodom and Gomorrah in a flash and flooding the whole world and drowning everybody. And so it's a very strange religion. You know, it's got these two sides, the vengeful God on the one side and the forgiving God on the other side. And uh, we, we live in the midst of this, I'll just call it a tension, not a contradiction. And by looking at football, you see it. I don't know what you do with it after you've seen it, but you see it. Right. And it's kind of interesting about football. Some, when I, my experience with football were some of my most, I had some of my most like touching kind of compassionate moments in football. Um, yes. Which is bizarre. Like, you know, where you really like, you, 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 when you mourn for a team member or that there's a, a player on the opposing team that goes down, like you all take a knee and, you know, you feel for the guy and you want to help him out. Um, and also like, you know, there was like a, a guy in my football team when we were playing that he was, he was, you know, he was slow. Like he was in the special ed classes, but yeah. he came out for the team. Um, and he you know, got picked on by everyone else, but like on our football team, like you did not mess with him. Like if we found out someone yeah. was messing with this guy, like you would have to deal with, you know, 10, 250 pound linemen. And we, sure. like, we protected that guy. Um, which I think is interesting. Like it actually, I was able to tap into sort of my nurturing side because of football. Yeah. No, that's a very good point. There is something a little bit Christian about that, isn't there? I hadn't thought of that. No, it's a band of brothers. There's no doubt about that. And once you are accepted uh, and have gone through the work and the pain and the strain and the sorrow and the grief together, uh, you, are, uh, you are one. You're a family. When I, when I went to my um, high school reunion, must have been my, um, oh, man, 45th high school reunion. Um, and a lot of people I was delighted to see. It was great. I had a wonderful time. But there's a special place in my heart for the guys I had played football with. And there are at least 10 or 12 of them there. And um, our pleasure in seeing each other, no matter how different we were now, no matter how little or how much we ostensibly had in common, was overwhelming. It was overwhelming. It was great. Yeah, yeah. I haven't, I haven't been able to replicate that experience. Um, well, bide your time. Bide your time. Okay, I got a while. I'm only yeah. 30. You got a while. I got a while. Okay, yeah, that's we, good to know. Um, yeah, well, it's great. Yeah. Um, so we mentioned earlier, uh, you know, your dad kind of taught you about manliness with football. Um, sort of the life of Jim Brown and uh, Tisdale. T Tidal? Is that? Uh, yeah, uh, Tittle. Tittle, Tittle, excuse me. Why a Tittle, yeah. Yeah, but it seems like, you know, we associate football with masculinity, obviously. It's very martial, but there's, um, there's a risk to it. That's kind of what makes football appealing. Is that risk connection with football, is that what makes football so appealing to men that there's this risk factor to it? I think it varies over time. I was watching some clips of high school football near me here in central Virginia the other night on Friday night, and there's some really good football players out there, but they're not hitting each other so hard that they're going to hurt each other very much at all. I mean, they just, you know, they're not strong enough, they're not fast enough, and probably, God knows, they're not mean enough. Every now and then you'll see a kid in the game who's bound for, um, uh, bound for a college career, maybe even a pro career, and the other players are kind of, whoa, what's coming my way? Um, so there's a kind of, in my favorite game, high school football, this, this hard contact, but the violence is not as emphatic as it becomes when you start to watch high power college football, as I do, I live around the corner this, uh, this fall from uh, the UVA football stadium and especially the pros. I mean, the, the amazing, it's, it, it's, you know, savage beauty, tragic beauty you see out there. They just wail each other. If you're down on the sidelines and you listen to them hit, it's like the thunder gone off. It's some kind of Jovian uh, experience. Um, and I think people are really having to deal with that in lots and lots of ways culturally. And it's not going to be easy. I don't know how much football is going to be played or how football is going to be played 20 years from now. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that brings it. We're having that, that conversation um in our culture right now, whether football should even have a role. I mean, so what are your thoughts? I mean, does football have a role or do the, the risk, the benefits of football outweigh the risk of the sport? Um, well, you know, I'm, uh, as long as the coach isn't crazy and some of them are, um, high school football is fantastic. Love it. Okay. Small college football. Fantastic. Love it. Those guys are good. They play hard. 
but they're not going to knock each other's spleens off or knock each other's heads off or break each other's spines or anything like that. That's probably just not going to happen. As you move up into big-time college and big-time pro, you're looking at a level of violence that is really distressing, it seems to me. I still watch it. I feel a certain amount of anxiety about watching it, a certain amount of guilt about watching it. My argument for it happening is the libertarian argument, basically, which is that... You know, you get some young guys and they look out into the world and they see that they will trade the prospect of bodily harm or even mental harm for the amazing excitement and camaraderie of the game and the money that's involved and the um, perks that are involved, the privileges that are involved, and they're willing to make that trade. Are they old enough to make that trade? Well, they're 21 and they could also go off to Iraq or Afghanistan or could have while we were, while we were there. So yes, they're old enough to make that trade. Um, but it still doesn't make me feel completely happy about it. If we only had uh, small college and um, uh, you know uh, high school football in America, I'd be a happier person. I'd go watch those games, and all would be well. Right again, there's that ambivalence um, about yeah, the sport. It, yeah, well, you know, but then you start really looking into sports, and you find out that there is many straight out concussions in soccer as there are in football people banging into the goalpost and the hardest i ever got hit in the head in my life was when i tried to head a soccer ball i decided i'd never do that again um but there are those sub concussive events in football that are really they build up and they can't be too good for you they can't be too good for you in the long run right right well mark it's been decades since you played football do you miss playing the game oh yeah i mean if uh, if there's some way I could get back in there and take a shot, I would I would be thrilled. But my body would last about one play, even if the guy across the line was being especially kind to me. The closest I get is pick up basketball, which I'm sort of rehabbing my way back into for what I hope will be one last long run, and that that has some of the satisfactions of football, but it's different. It is different because I mean, like I remember before the last game football career of my game during our playoffs. A coach told yeah. the seniors, like, you know, this could be the last time you step on a field with yes. pads. So play like it. And you know what? He was right. I've I've never I've played flag football. I've played touch football. I've done pickup basketball. You know, but flag and touch football aren't really football. Not the same. No, they're not the same. You know, no, that's a big what, I mean, day. Yeah. I mean, what does the fin- you know the finitude of football teach us about? Is there is there a lesson there, you think? Well, you know, they say athletes die twice and that uh, you die the last day that you uh, play the game and then you die, of course, corporeally sometime uh, later down the line. Um, and yeah, I mean, it does teach you about finitude in a certain way. Though I, I guess I think that it's always possible to take what you learned in football and as long as you're not named by the game, to bring it over to pick up basketball or to other games that might serve you in middle age as well as football served you as a young guy. I played pick up basketball with the same uh, guys for 20 years. And uh, that did more for me uh, in terms of you know social life and friends and un- mutual understanding between guys. Continuing on playing football in some semi-pro league could ever possibly have done. So, you know, to everything there's a season, and, and I was pleased to make that uh, make that jump. In terms of the intensities of football, well, you know, you're probably not going to find that other places, but I found intensity plus camaraderie plus good intellectual exchange. This particular group was full of, you know, book writers and um, all kinds, and doctors and therapists and all kinds of tremendously interesting people that I never would have gotten to meet had it not been for the basketball game. Okay, so you can look, still look for those opportunities elsewhere. You can. You can. They're, they're different intensities, but they exist. They exist. Well, let's switch, let's switch gears a bit. Um, you've got a new book out about writing. Uh, can you tell us, which I read, again, like your other books, fantastic. Um, well, thank you so much. Can you tell us about what this, what this book is about and like, what you're hoping to convey through it? I'm hoping to convey the joy of writing. Uh, why write is about... Um, what you can gain by way of intellectual development, uh, rather than just phys- physical or physical intellectual development, by way of writing. You know, it teaches you how to um, uh, argue. It teaches you how to perceive things. It teaches you how to, as it were, make sense. And uh, it also it discloses to you aspects of yourself that you never would have known were there. You know, I mean, the third book I wrote was a book about gothic, right? About scary movies, scary books, stuff that had fascinated me when I was a boy. Did I know I was ever going to write a book about that? No. But once I started writing it, I was obsessed by it. 
And so a new part of myself grew and a new set of interests grew, and it was incredibly exhilarating uh, to do that. Um, and I think the mind, as I said before, the mind strengthens the way the body does, and you can strengthen it through reading, and sometimes reading is, you know, kind of like, can be a little bland. Um, you're not really plunging in there. Or you can strengthen it through writing, where you try to get your ideas down on paper and show them to other people and talk them over. And I think that's an incredibly enriching and enlarging experience. The best education I know of, really, is the education by writing, though it's hard to do. Yeah, writing, I, mean, I find whenever, I don't really know what I have to say until I actually sit down and write it. Cause it actually Nothing me. wrong with that. I Right. I mean, what do you what do you tell for someone who's listening? I mean, yeah, I love this analogy that writing is sort of exercise for the mind. Um, how does a guy who gets started who doesn't really write? He's like, I'm not a writer, but I want to get that benefit from. It. How do you get? Do you just start writing, and then, or is there sort of re a regimen you can follow, like you would with your football training, to get better at writing? Yeah. Well, um, you know, you got to try. The thing I advise people to try uh, first is to write about their childhood a little bit. You know, what was it? Where'd you live? Who were your friends? What was it like? Any stories you have from back then? Um, they're your stories. It's your life. And so you have every right to them. And that's a place that people often can be very successful in, uh, in writing. And then the other thing I say is don't expect too much. You know, I know people say, you know, I've had this novel I've always wanted to write, and I'm going away to New Hampshire for seven days, and I think I'm going to get it written then. Don't. I mean, maybe, maybe, but that's probably not going to happen. You know, a little bit every day and a little bit more the next week and a little bit more the next week, if you have the time, um, can help you a lot. And the other thing is, you know, writing every day. If you can do it, write every day. Stephen King writes every day but his birthday and Christmas, I think. And he's written some books. I don't love them all, but he's written some books. Right. Well, Mark, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Those are just wonderful questions. I'm very grateful. My guest today was Mark Edmondson. He's the author of the book, Why Football Matters. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. And also while you're there, check out his new book, Why Write. Great book if you uh, are a writer or want to become a writer. A lot of great insights there. Also check out the show notes at aom.is slash why football matters for links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic. 